Hello everyone. Um, I uh, very glad to be here. I didn't realise six hours took so long. Uh, a bit that scared me most, I think, was uh, when I've been winding my way from Wodonga through the through the hills there, and I thought, God, my arms are not going to make much further, and I came to a sign that said three three miles of windy road. <laughs> I wondered what I'd been on. <laughs> Put this down a little bit. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to come today. I, I, uh, I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, and I was told I was given 20 minutes to talk tell you the story of my life. Uh, and then I saw how long it took to get a <coughs> photograph, and I thought, <laughs> maybe I'll get a bit longer. Um, and I realised that, that when you get to my age, and you start to forget a lot of stuff, and uh, like that's 20 minutes is going to be okay anyway. <laughs> and you realise that you know uh, Alzheimer's is actually God's way of stopping old farts talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you guys are here to do well. I'm just about done. Um, I had a fairly big year this year. It's been. Uh, it's been really quite momentous for me. I, I turned 70 and I sold the body shop and I have no idea how you've got good products in the bathroom because the buggers won't give me a discount. <laughs> uh, but uh, I just wanted to talk through some of the things that have happened to me over that period. Um, I guess deep down as a young person I always wanted to have my own business. I always thought this is a great thing to do. My dad was a butcher. Uh, he was self self-employed, if you like, and this idea of actually owning your own business. And actually, I was quite um, inspired by Scrooge McDuck. Uh, <laughs> but I, I had this concept that really would be nice to have a swimming pool full of money. You could dive into and swim around in. And you, could, you probably don't even know, know who Scrooge McDuck is. Yeah. But, okay, yeah. but um, the weakness of my whole idea was, in fact, that I didn't have a product. I had, I had plenty of great business names, and with a name like surname like Wise, you could sort of you know, go up, up into raptures. So, you know, Wise International Trading, <laughs> Wise Developments, etc. Et et uh, the thing that became quite clear to me was you actually you have to have a product. So I sort of sat back and said, "Okay, I don't have a product. Um, I'll go and work for somebody else." So, I started off working for BHP, uh, straight from school, and did my university degree part-time with them, uh, until uh, I really got the, I can take this hat off again, my head's warmed up a bit. Um, I realised that actually being at the university was good fun, and I wanted to be full-time. So I went full-time, and when I came to graduate, or before I graduated, actually I joined Alcoa, aluminium company. And uh, I spent 15 years with Alcoa uh, here in Australia and, and, and overseas, and uh, it was brilliant. And then Alcoa sacked me, uh, which was, I thought they were a really clever company up to that point. <laughs> <laughs> it took them 15 years to work me out. And uh, anyway, we, we parted company in, in reasonably amicable circumstances, but um, I joined Maya. So I had three really important companies that were employing me. So here I am thinking I want to be an entrepreneur and I want to start my own company, but actually I was working for uh, most non-entrepreneurial sort of uh, uh, involvement. So um, what happened was quite a fluke, um, because after 20 years of working for other companies, I, I did begin my own business. Um, but it was a bit of um, what you call the Clayton's own business because uh, it's the business you have when somebody else has invented it for you. And I, together with a business partner, started the body shop in Australia. And we had got the Australian franchise for the body shop. That was in 1983. And as I said, just, uh, just this year I've uh, sold uh, the business back to the Body Shop International. I, I worked on the principle that they did not want a 75-year-old uh, head franchisee for Australia. In fact, I knew they didn't need my 69-year-old one, but uh, I hung in as long as I, I, I could. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I just want to talk a little bit about entrepreneurial behaviour because um, you might ask me what, what took me so long and, and I indicated before you have to have a good product if you're going to be actually be in business. You can talk about all the P's of the marketing mix that you've probably been exposed to over the years, uh, you know, the product, price, place, promotion, people. All of those things you get taught uh, the essence and you've got to mix them up. There's only one that really matters, and that's product. Because if you don't have a good product, it doesn't matter about any of the rest at all. Uh, product is really, really important. And the definition of product is is um, is really broad, in my view, because it actually does include so many, so many things. And and the thing that probably people don't um, truly appreciate as much as um, I've reflected on at this. Um, it, it, it's passion. It's actually having a product that you're passionate about and you can actually engage your customers in being passionate about. And sometimes you don't do that because it's a lotion or a potion in my case. It's actually what the company itself stands for is actually the product. And the, the, uh, the beauty of what Anita Roddick did when she started the company was she actually imbued something pretty ordinary and commonplace which was cosmetic products, she imbued that with a sense of product that was the ethos of the brand. And the brand actually said, we, we stand for something. We stand for business having social responsibility. And I, I, I think that really made the product of the body shop very, very strong. And it meant that the people who bought it uh, really, really engaged with it. Now you have to have the other stuff too. You've got to have the promotion and you've got to have, the, you've got to have a good price. Um, and you've got you've got to you know, have your location drive and distribute it all. But that really is the mechanics of the business. I used to call it fluff, you know, because it, I really want to emphasise very strongly how, much, how how important product is. You know, the, the, other, the idea of selling ice to Eskimos is, is is really not really something we should think about. We should really got to talk about building that product up to be something that people really really. Want. So when you get it down to that, it's peop it all comes down to people at that point. And you say to yourself, you know, it's the people who work within the company. Do they get that passion? Do they believe in the company they work for? Do they believe in the product? So that when they go out, they become evangelists. And this leads me, I guess, onto ethos. That, 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 company, that, that concept of actually having a, a business that um, has an ethos that stands for something. The body shop over the years stood for all sorts of things that, if you actually boil it down, they're all motherhood statements. Believing in protect, protecting the planet. Believing that we shouldn't test products on animals. Trying to defend human rights. Activating self-esteem. And something else. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was getting old. It'll come to me. Um, the Body Shop was, 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 was founded by Anita Roddick, as you all probably know. Anita was a great entrepreneur. She didn't have any business background at all, so I think that was probably an advantage. She was a teacher, uh, and she was also a bit of a, an adventurer and travelled around the world a lot. And uh, in 1976, she started this little cosmetics business <coughs> right in England. Because, and I don't know how many of you have heard this story, but uh, uh, her husband, Gordon, uh, decided that he wanted to ride a horse from Buenos Aires to New York, and you know, as you do, and and he was uh, uh, he was a, a young man who went to boarding school and, and used to read a lot of adventure stories and uh, stories of explorers and adventurers and there was a fellow called Shifley. And Shifley wrote a book, I think he called it Shifley's Ride. And the idea was he was going to ride a horse from Buenos Aires to New York and he, and, and he made it. And uh, he, um, he inspired Gordon to want to do the same thing. So Gordon set off to ride a horse from Buenos Aires to New York leaving Anita back in England with two little children. And that sort of stuff, I have no idea how he got away with it. Um, but she had to keep herself um, painfully employed, so she said, I'll start a little business. And this little business became what you see today. And, 
the interesting thing was after after she opened the first shop, which had gone extremely well, she didn't have enough money for the second. So a girlfriend of hers said, "Oh, you've got to meet. You've got to meet um, my my boyfriend, um, Ian. He, he's he's got plenty of money. He runs a garage." So Ian bought half the company for four thousand mm. pounds in about nineteen seventy seven. When Gordon heard about this, he got such a fright that one of his horses fell over a cliff and he thought he'd better come back because she had a tiger by the tail and she was selling it all off at a million miles an hour. So he came back and started working with Anita and they built the business together. I think um, the thing that really impressed me about the whole business is that, that concept of passion. Now, how do you actually involve um, a, 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 a truly commercial business into doing something that people really that resonates with people's souls. And Anita used to always say that business shapes the world. It, it, is, it, it is capable of transforming society in almost any way you can think of. And so if business isn't governed by a moral sense of purpose, then God help us all. And that is a really, really important thing that I think about all the time. And I've always wanted to own a company or run a company that that, that actually was the sort of company I'd like to work for. And I think I've kept that principle very close to me all the way along. I've always had a very strong belief that, and we're not put on this earth to just to make money. It's nice to have money and to be able to buy good things with it. And uh, I, I, I certainly have done very nicely. But it's really important to be able to say at the end of the day, I've really done as much as I can to satisfy that inner part of me that sort of says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the person I am. And we've tried to actually bring that into the company. So we as a company have always done the, the um, community project volunteering two, two days a year. Our staff go off and do whatever they feel is a really important thing and they really get into it. But then we've, um, we've done things from reading newspapers onto the blind, onto, the, onto tape for the blind. We've, we've gone and make coffee for the elderly. We've worked sit with adults with the uh, young people who suffer from anorexia and try and have a chat with them about stuff. And that goes right across the company and there's, there's a huge number of hours of being put in and still are being put in. But we've gone further than that and Anita started a organisation many years ago called Children on the Edge. Children on the Edge um, was set up in, in uh, response to the Romanian orphans crisis that after the Ceausescu regime, all the children that had been basically abandoned by the state and they were three or four years old and never been picked up and cuddled and she set up a virtually a group of volunteer staff to go and clean the orphanages, replumb them, make them better and have play groups with kids and that concept's still going. <coughs> we got involved with um, our staff in a, uh, uh, a children's centre in, in East Timor after the uh, after the troubles that they were having there, after independence. And we ran that from 2000 right through to uh, a year and a half ago where the government said, we would like to run it now. Thank you very much for all you've done. And that's a perfect uh, result for us. So we're moving on to doing work now in East Timor uh, with those kids that are actually now employment age. Other things that we've done uh, since those days has, have spun off into a foundation that we now run. Uh, we've set up a shoe shining business which is uh, to provide a, uh, a gainful employment for uh, refugees and other people who have been excluded from the workforce and it's called Buffed. And if any of you work in uh, high rise buildings around Australia you may have come across anyone seen one? No oh, good. People get your shoes shine there? I didn't but today, but I did it myself. But it's such a fantastic option. Uh, there are people, there's a guy in uh, 120 Collins Street in Melbourne called Asefa, Asefa's Ethiopian. He, he spent 19 years in a refugee camp in Kenya before he got the gong to come to Australia. He has very lim had very limited English, he had no friends, he, he, his family had been dispersed across the world. And yet he got the, he eventually got through the, what they call the queue, if you like, and got to Australia. But it took 19 years. Now you, you understand why people want to get on boats and come here because 19 years is a long, long time. 
Anyway, Sefer has got his own business now. He pays a franchise fee at the end of his tenure. If he sort of gets to a stage where he wants to do something different, he will have an estate. He will be able to sell that business back to the, the, the Rudafka organization and uh, we'll be able to pass that on to somebody else. But hopefully we'll have uh, buff shoe shining all across, across the country. And we've got, we're talking with our Irish colleagues who want to put, put it into uh, Ireland and uh, maybe into the UK and perhaps into the States. Except in the States it's probably a very well established thing uh, and uh, it probably won't have the same resonance there initially. So, let me talk about some of the things we've done over the years. We've got involved in some really quite interesting um, social activism. We campaigned a lot as a business. We ran a campaign against nuclear testing in the South Pacific. Uh, when, when the French were uh, dropping, uh, testing their bombs off Murara Atoll, we collected a, a million signatures from around the South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, the whole shooting match, and we had them on postcards, everyone. We took the postcards to France and delivered them to the Elysee Palace. And the French stopped, and so we reckon we had a part in that. We also got involved very heavily in reconciliation when the program was on in, the, in 2000. We got our customers to sign up for their support. They put their thumbprints onto a small piece of yellow cloth, every customer, we got over 100,000 thumbprints, we had them sewn onto a huge banner, and that banner was about 10 metres by 8 metres. It was carried over every bridge in Australia through all those marches by staff and customers. That was a really, really profoundly moving thing. We got involved in trying to stop the um, execution of the Agoni Nine in, in Nigeria. It didn't hit the press very much here in Australia, but in the UK it was very strong. A fellow called Ken Sarawiwa was executed with eight other people uh, because they complained about the fact that Shell were working with the Nigerian government to actually pollute their lands and take, take their um, livelihoods away from them and they're trying to, to um, exploit oil and that was a really, really hard campaign to do. But later on in my life, Shell, the leader of Shell in Australia acknowledged in fact that had changed the way Shell behaved, that campaign was put on, it on, uh, on that particular subject. Uh, we've, we've got involved in trade pro projects. We've in, the, today the body shop uses an awful lot of products that are generated through working with local communities in different emerging countries and developing countries to uh, to make sure that they can get a livelihood out of that. And so their products go into what you'd call a, a mainstream uh, economic business. What we've been doing has been a joy and. Uh, I've actually loved every minute of the 32 years. I don't think uh, I've had a day where I've thought that I'm not doing something I'm really proud of. Some of the things I've been doing are just crashly commercial, you know, arguing with landlords and all that sort of thing. That's incredibly satisfying when you win. It doesn't happen very often anymore. <laughs> but um, <laughs> being in a business, in a company that really has a commitment to putting into society in a positive way is a very, very rewarding way of going about things. So our, our remaining businesses, and we've spun off a lot of businesses, just because I've sold the body shop, life still goes on. Uh, we spun off a lot of businesses from that. We have a shop fitting company. We have a computer solutions company called Kickbox. We have a publishing company called Affirm Press. Uh, we have a joinery company, did I say? Uh, we have uh, a foundation of some wonderful things. And I'll have plenty to do as I, as I continue on. I think being uh, part of the body shop as it grew up and watching how somebody like Anita and somebody like Gordon, who's still doing great, wonderful things, tried to actually humanize business and make us all realize that just because you're in business, you don't actually have to be a bastard. It's quite okay. And I have a really, really, um, I love saying this, you don't leave your humanity on the hat stand when you come to work. You take it in with you and you wear it all day long. So I think I've got to the end of my time, have I? Um, 
Uh, just to close, uh, the businesses that exist today that are continuing work under uh, what we call the three circles of responsibility. We have three interlocking circles, and if any one of you ever uh, get one of our business cards or see a, a logo for the Adida Group, there's three interlocking circles. And those three interlocking circles are economic success, stakeholder fulfillment, and positive social and environmental change. And the idea is that if you make sure that all of those three circles are satisfied in any business decision you make, you will be doing all right. You can't, you can't run a business if it's not economically successful. Not, if your stakeholders are not fulfilled, that's customers and staff, then it won't reach its success. And if you don't have a positive environmental and social attitude to life, then you're really not doing a damn good job at all. So, anyway, thank you very much for all the time.